How can we do a transfer deadline day without speaking to the one and only Mr. Peter Odomwingi? So you know that, that obviously the embarrassment of of being left at the door at QPR, so to speak. How does how do you recover from that mentally? So I jumped on the wall next to my gate and looked over the the gate. There's about I don't know 10, 15 people there, guys with balaclavas and hoodies on, all like ballied up. Think I'm thinking, what they come to rob my house? Like, Steve, I I can't believe that this is true. The numbers. This is something made up by us, an enemy of Barcelona because they want Messi to get upset with Barcelona and leave. Yes, everybody, welcome back. We finally got a name for the show, Vibe with Five. I'm here with Rio Ferdinand, Stephen Housen, and we're about to give you the daily, I say daily, the weekly transfer news, the weekly football news. Thank you very much for giving us the name. What do you reckon of the name, Rio? I'm all over it. When I see it come through the group chat, I thought Vibe with Five, that's the one. That is the one. Yeah. Steve? I feel attacked. This is what we've been slinging at United fans, isn't it? All tactic, no vibe. Oh, no tactics, all vibes. No, no, no. This is nice. Right, I look, like it. I like get it. To it, Rio. What are you saying? Good tune, man? though. It is a good tune. Who's the, who's on the who's on the intro? Who is it? Oh, it's Vamp. My guy Vamp uh, produced the song. You know what I mean? Did a really good job. Him, Steely on the beats. Those guys, man. They fe- they're feeling obviously Man United fans and that. So. You know, they jumped to the opportunity. Yeah. Oh, they did go for a freebie. I like it. I love that. <laughs> Say that. <laughs> He's going to get at me. <laughs> it's transfer dead, like, you know, it's transfer deadline day, obviously. Like, it's crazy, man. Like, and it's what's been your best transfer deadline signing in years gone by? Go on, Joel. Let's find out what Arsenal's was. I think it's really obvious, isn't it? It's got to be a Um, when we got him, it's funny because he was having a few issues at Dortmund. So, it was a January one as well, wasn't it? Yeah, he was a January one. And I think they weren't, obviously he weren't really getting on with, you know, the people at Dortmund, whatever. I find it funny though, because a lot of clubs at the time, it was one of those windows where a lot of clubs weren't snooping in for him, which is very strange. Like we, we seemed like we were the only people in there and we all we had to do was agree a fee. And boy, oh boy, that was, you know, the best decision we've made. For me, the best striker we've had since Thierry Henry. So, Definitely, we've got our money's worth on that. Well, better than Robin Van Persie? Yeah, if you think about it, because at li- I don't know, you guys can take shots if you want, innit? Yeah, but oh, I'm Connor, saying, don't worry about that. Yeah, no. Nah. I'm just asking you <laughs> a question. You think, I'm, why are you stuttering? Nah, like, what's wrong you, with you? Look, you ask questions, but I know there's the undertone there, innit? But for the sake of the viewers, I'm going to answer the question. Yeah, because <laughs> if you think of it, yeah. At least when RVP was there, obviously, you know, well, he still didn't win the league regardless, did it? But either way, I think Aubameyang's helped us in a time where if we didn't have him, we would have had nothing at all. So, well, yeah. RVP won the league, didn't he? Brothers, look, talk about your transfer to the land age. You know what I mean? Like, I've done my bit. Go on, Steve. Berber one was a shock because it seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, the most shocking one, I was in America for it, so my timeline was all all sorts of messed up, was when we got Falcao on deadline day. That blew me away, that, because I, I still believed, deludedly, that he was going to be absolutely mint, and he obviously wasn't. Um, but that was like, Welbeck's gone, De Gea was gone, but didn't go, and we signed Falcao. You're like, wait, what? what's happened? Madness. Hang, hang on, Tony Marshall as well was a deadline day one, wasn't it? Did we get Tevez on, on deadline day as well? I think he went to West Ham on a dead... I think him and Mascherano tips up at West Ham on a yeah. deadline day, I think. Uh, Berbatov, I didn't think that was out of the blue. I thought uh, <clears throat> maybe because you're at the club and you hear the, 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 the vibes coming through and you think, uh, actually, vibes, vibes, yeah. And you think like, whoa, he could be coming through at any point. Hopefully he comes through. And then all of a sudden, you get a transfer deadline day. Man United at the type of club, we get our business done early and it's done. And then I just thought we'd probably missed out on it. And then all of a sudden we get the deal done and you think, yes, another player. Where are you? Are you at home for that? Or are you in the club? What are you doing? I'm not sure where I was. I just remember the lads ringing, texting each other in the group and that and going, right, well, yeah, Berbatov's coming. Then you start texting a few people who played with him, with it, who I know played with him at Spurs. 
like Robbie Keane and uh, I think Defoe and people like that, whoever it was, Edley King, and you ask him, like, how good is he? Was he like, Eric were asking him questions. I think if Carrots was there with him, but we're asking everyone questions. You start, all you start doing is fishing. What's he like? Is he a nice lad or not? Over, and then he turns up and he thinks he's part of the good first cast or Carlito's <laughs> way or Scarface. Um, but he's a, he's a top man, Berber. Top man. It was his birthday the other day. I wished him well on social media, but he's, um, he came in. He's a different type of character. And I think that's the thing. You've got to have people that come in and buy into the club immediately. Like It's the last air transfer window. They've A lot of the time they've missed part of the season or they've missed a lot of pre-season. Um, and so you need a good character to come in and someone who's willing to work, willing to knuckle down and get involved and hit the ground running. And to be fair to Berber, some people may say, oh, he's a lazy player. He looks lazy, but he done his extras in the gym. He worked on himself. His nutrition was perfect. Everything in terms of getting himself ready for the game, his own way, very meticulous. Could he have done more running and training? Yes, he could have. I used to be on him. But what a player, man. Touch. He had the, he had the touch among people with a touch. You called him the velvet touch, didn't it? You said he had, like, yeah, I see it on your story. You said he had a touch, mad touch. Velcro touch, everything. I can't imagine some of the stuff that he did in training with that touch. You know, Berber used to try and play centre back. I think I, like the last year or two years he was there in training, and we used to have a game at the end. You do all your tactical stuff and all your other stuff, forwards against defenders, et cetera. Then in the game, like an eight or something pitch time he'd just go on half but like he was never on my team to do that because he was olders against youngers so we would never have had that me and Vida would have said nah move what are you doing but on the younger team <laughs> he, he was like the oldest one on their team and he used to play centre back he was good man he was decent on the ball out of defence like Beckenbauer who, who else moved around a lot in training position wise you know Rooney's got that reputation of doing everything on it no, you know, it was funny. You used to, in training, like in them games. Like, so training was really serious, trust me. But And the games at the end were serious. But some people would play a different position. Roy Keane used to love it on the left wing. He'd go left wing sometimes and just try and curl it in the top bins all the time. Like, funny. <laughs> but like, just weird. You wouldn't expect that. Um, who else? Who else used to move about? Um, that, that was it, really. Everyone mainly played their positions. They're the main two that I remember playing different positions. You know what I mean? Giggsy was always out on the wing. Cristiano was out there. Like me and Vida would be at the back. The young, we used to, it used to be olders against the youngers. And the youngers used to get slapped up consistently every Friday. They'd, they'd always go one nil up and they'd start celebrating. And you used to have like Nani, um, Anderson, Tom Cleverly, Welbeck, all them boys there. Then you're like small in and all them boys, and they get a goal, and you'd dead think, oh, the the, the, the silver twins. And then it just be cool. Just just ah, huh? no, 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 it'd be like it'd be like maybe like ten aside or eight aside on a on a, on a smaller pitch or like a small pitch, eight aside, nine aside pitch. And who were the, the, the most impressive? Who were the most impressive? Mm. Who was the most impressive? Yeah, the youngers. Um, in the younger team, Welbeck was good. He scored a hat trick on the, the 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 night before the Champions League final in Moscow. You know that. And we started a riot on the pitch, like we went nuts. So I think we the olders must have lost the game or something, but by one goal. But it was like there was a bad decision, and the managers shut the session down. Like people were going, it was all that like almost fighting and stuff. But Welbeck scored a hat trick the night before. And was thinking, right, he might have to start now. But um, he, did, he wasn't even the squad, was he? He was in a suit. No, no, he did, he's in his suit. He was in his suit. But what an experience for a young player to come to Moscow like he did. You know what I mean? So, but um, who was in the younger team really good? They, they, all of them were good, man. It was all good. But they, with the older team, we used to destroy them. The experience was too it was too overpowering. They couldn't deal with the pressure. And then when the talking started, if we come back to 1-1 and went 2-1 up, I'd be chatting. The boys would be shouting, oh, they, they've gone, they've gone. <laughs> they couldn't deal with it. Funny times. Do you always partner with Vidic in that? Was that a deliberate thing as well? No, it was just because it was olders versus youngers. And in some days you wouldn't play olders versus youngers and the manager would split me and Vida up and then he'd split like just, just two strikers up and whatnot. So he would um he'd put a young one with me, a young one with Vida. Um but yeah, it was good, man. It was um them games on especially on a Friday before a game used to be intense. Like 
you could ruin your day if you're losing that game. That's hunger, man. Going the back to uh, the contract stuff, yeah, uh, transfers, contract stuff. Did you ever, like, when a new player's coming in, are you ever worrying about, oh, okay, cool, this guy's coming, he's on this particular wage packet, or is that ever something that you're looking at, or are you just focusing on other stuff? Because, obviously, everyone's, you know, new guys come in, you're probably thinking about your contract next. How does that sit in your head? No, I'm just thinking, is this player going to help us win? That's it. That's all I care about. Is he going to make us better? So when Carrick came after Roy Keane left, is he going to be like Roy Keane? No, he's not. But is he going to improve us? Yes, he is. If he plays to his potential. The same with someone like Tevez. The same with someone like Cristiano, Berbatov, like Saha. All these players that come in, you're just sitting there thinking, will they improve us? Will they improve us? And to be fair, when uh, Patrice Ever and Vidic come, we were sitting there going, I don't what have we signed? They're rubbish at the time when they first signed because they just couldn't adapt like immediately like you need it to. And footballers are really harsh cr critics and like, we, we judge people on day one. And if, we're judge, if we were judging Vid Vidic and Ever, they probably would never have made United careers like after day, day one, but ended up being absolute legends. But it's, it is a weird situation. I don't think about people's money and whatever I, when they sign for a football club. Like Berbatov signed Van Persie sign. I'm not thinking, oh, what are they on? I could care less. But when you go and deal, you will start then talking about certain numbers that you've seen. Where am I in that line? Do you know what I mean? And that's the way it goes. That's normal negotiations. So that's part and parcel of it. And the clubs understand that. Rio, the only time I can remember you having any sort of grief was while you was banned in 2004, your contract renewal then, do you want to talk to us about what happened then? Because I think some of the fanzines had it in for you a little bit, didn't they? Yeah, like th th these contract things, but obviously this is transfer deadline day, yeah? So like contractually, like fans get so amped up, they're excited, they want to see things happen. My situation was a bit different, but it was about contract as well. And like I remember I hadn't signed my new deal. I'd been offered, but obviously you're, you're negotiating with the football club. So they come in with an offer. I say that's not where I want to be. We've got to find an area where we're common ground, where we're both together. And that takes negotiation. That's time. And normally contracts, there, there could be one that does get done in a week or two. There could be one that takes two or three months, like mine did. Or there's one that took six to eight months. You never know. But I was in the middle somewhere. Fans weren't happy about it. And, and obviously during that time of negotiation, I, I went to a restaurant in London with my previous agent at the time to meet him for something to, to eat in London. And then Peter Kenny, who was the chief executive at Chelsea, was there. He went out, someone took a picture, and it looked like I was there meeting him, negotiating to go to Chicago. So far from the truth, it was unbelievable. But because of that picture, it absolutely killed me in terms of my relationship with the United fans at the time, because it looked like it, I was using it as a bargaining tool to actually get a bigger deal, which it wasn't. That's not the way I am. I just said, listen, this is what I want, and let's find a way to get to it. But... Obviously, coming back to Manchester on that Monday morning, I was summoned to the manager's office immediately, and he went absolutely nuts, like shredded me. Like, what are you doing? You're naive. How dare you do this? But I was just like, listen, it weren't my fault. Someone just took a busy rat, just took out a phone and took a picture of me in a time when it wasn't really a real big phone kind of picture taking type generation we was in at the time. So I didn't think it would happen, but it was time, it was off, it was wrong. But then I um I was negotiating and the, the big thing about the negotiations is like the question you said to me before was about do you have a problem when someone comes in about their money and, and does it affect you? No, it's just all it is is about I look around the change room and I understand that I want parity. I have a, a number that I feel given of what I've seen other people and what the, what the market looks like, where I should be within that changing room and what the club I'm at. And so there's a going rate to pay and, and you, you, you state that in negotiations and you try and find a, an area where everyone's happy and that's what we did in the end and I just wanted to be there. I think my, my sticking point is I wanted five years and they wanted to give me four years and I eventually got five years and the manager said, I wouldn't have given you that but you're lucky that you got it. And <laughs> Didn't, it would the magazines kick off as well or stir up some shit as well and end up outside your house? Yeah, the fanzines, what are they called? Is it uh, uh, United, We Stand and stand, Red? Uh, yeah. They, they 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 were going nuts. They were 
they were right, but they didn't understand the background to the story and that, and, and they wouldn't obviously because you, you don't talk about it in public. But yeah, man, I was at my house one day and all of a sudden the, the, the bell rings and someone put their hand over so I couldn't see the actual camera. I couldn't see who was on it. So I, I thought, who's this cheeky rat? Let me go outside and you can't, you can have a row, whatever it is. Don't take liberties coming to my house. So I jumped on the wall next to my gate and looked over the, the gate. There's about, I don't know, 10, 15 people there. Guys with balaclavas and hoodies on, all like ballied up. Think I'm thinking, what? They come to rob my house, like. And then luck, luckily, one of them shouted, like, "Just sign the contract!" Ah, started shouting. I said, "Listen, shut, shut up." So I got a bit of confidence, thinking they're not going to rob my house. It's just about the football. <laughs> so, listen, what are you coming to my house for? If I followed your missus home and sat outside your house and waited outside your house with all my mates, would you be happy? No, you wouldn't. We go home. Don't come to my house. You don't go to Bex's house or to. Roy Keane's ass, but you're coming here. What's wrong with you? And I said, to be fair, I said to him, at the end of the day, I'm going to resign. I want to stay. I don't want to go nowhere else. But I'm negotiating. Let me negotiate. That's it. And then What it, did they say? What did they say after that? Yeah, they was like, yeah, all right. We just wanted to know. Just think it's like you're taking liberties with, uh, with the children. I said, listen, you don't know the full background of the story. So don't come to my house asking me no questions. And then but it, we left it on good terms at the end. It was all right. They were, they were fine. They was all boozed up, I think. And like uh, they ended up going police style and started coming. A neighbor called the, the clear runner. All right, Rio, in regards to what you've seen with uh, Marcus Rashford this weekend, obviously Tony Marshall earlier uh, last week as well. What's your thoughts on it all, man? Why are we still here in this situation today? It disgusts me, man. It's disgusting. Um, there's not enough words to explain uh, how it is. And I think it's time now, man, If that... that, that these social media platforms, they have to step up and take responsibility. They own these platforms. They understand the algorithms. They've got the, techno the technology at their hands, at their fingertips to make change for good. They can do it. What is the problem? What's holding them back? Tell us. What is holding you back from doing this? Because um, the, the hate, the trolling that you get online like this and the discrimination that you see, that is constantly happening the high profile players, but also people in normal walks of life, any walk of life, this is happening. There should be an algorithm that sets off a, a, a buzzer that says, no, this isn't right. And this person's now going to be evicted or ejected or thrown for this social media platform and banned. That should be the case. People And, and then people should actually be put on a website or somewhere or on an app somewhere where we can see who these people are. Do you know what I mean? I don't know, just because it's just, there's got to be some sort of deterrent for these absolutely ignorant people that are doing this type of thing. And because there is no deterrent at the moment, people feel this is like the Wild West. They can do what they want. Do you think it is? I mean, last week we saw that guy that um, that had a Snapchat video that went viral. And I think he lost his job as a Sunday League manager and lost his job. That's mm. a racist guy. I'm not sure that that's the norm. I think a lot of what you're seeing behind these anonymous accounts is people looking for reactions. No, but, oh, no, maybe. Well, so it's, it's okay to say that because we don't know. So if we make these people public, then you see the reaction. Then you see actually, oh, he's got a bit of history that he is actually, because you can do a bit of fishing. You can find out through his circle, his network of friends or associates. Oh, actually, he's got history. There's another video that he'd done the other day. Or there's other stuff that he's been putting online on other platforms. So, so if you can actually then... You can, you can put a web that goes alongside them certain people's profiles. You get a better understanding of who they are. We can, we're always going to have these questions and people are always going to have an out when there's no face to the actual picture. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, That's the problem. Get, people get confident when it's just an egg. Do you know what I mean? They, they mm, think they can exactly. get away with it. But if, if someone thinks, oh, you know what? I need to think about what I say. Whether you're a 12-year-old, whether you're a racist, you're going to think twice because you know that, you know, right about now, it's the, uh, I reckon companies are just about profiting in, in the sense where, you know, they need as much people to sign up as much as possible. When you start putting things like ID, it makes their job a little bit harder because then they, they have to yeah, have Yeah, but like, Joe, man, how much money do these companies want now, bro? Like, these tech companies are billions and billions. How much more do you want to extract? Like, you're at a good place now, surely. Like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. They're at a good place. Face-to-face, like -face, Joel, at the Etihad. Yeah, I experienced it a couple of years ago. I don't know if you saw Rio, yeah, but um, I went to, I was covering a Man City game. Was you there that day, Steve? I think you came here afterwards. Yeah, so basically, um, one guy was talking some nonsense about 
you know, interviewing him, like proper normal interview. And then he ends up the thing with saying something like, yeah, uh, go feed your family to Africa. Something along those lines. Bruv, when I initially put it out on socials, people were actually messaging me like, oh, it's not even that bad. What are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Blah, 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 blah. Bruv, it wasn't until um, Righty um, got hold of it. Um, Righty and his agent, they were like, nah, we're not having this, bro. We're back in this, Joel. Like, we're actually back in it. This ain't right. And Stormzy as well, he got hold of it as well. And he was just like, nah, we're not having this. And yeah, the guy, we we made sure that it made the papers and stuff like that. The way I look at it is, you know, if it's my dad, yeah, or your dad or whoever's dad, yeah, and they don't have a platform, how are they going to be able to voice this opinion? Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's important that we do it the right way. So big shout out to Rashi. He doesn't want to put the screenshots out there like what he said, but it's it's important like what you're saying, Rio and Steve. We need to clamp down on this, man. Like we need to see who's dealing with this. Lionel Messi's contract got leaked in El Mundo, um, which apparently is a Real Madrid paper. So there might be some exaggerations going on here. But listen to this. 555 million euros over four years. He's 33 now, soon to be 34. 138 million per season fixed, which is 2.6 million a week, um, plus variables. So I guess there's bonuses in there. 115 million as a renewal fee just to sign and a 77.9 million loyalty bonus. So for me, this is a club that's a Billion in debt, by the way. They owe hundreds of millions across Europe for all the different players they bought recently. This feels like a bad move financially. Like they almost make Newcastle look well run. Like mm. the money they've blown on players lately. This is nuts, man. Steve, I, I can't believe that this is true. The numbers. I don't believe that these numbers are true. I don't think it's sustainable. I don't, I don't think it, it doesn't. It doesn't scream realism to me. Um, <laughs> this is something made up by an enemy of Barcelona because they want Messi to get upset with Barcelona and leave. It has to be. Like, them numbers are just crazy. That they're, they're social media platform numbers. They're, like, <laughs> crazy, man. But what I would say, I, me and my friends were talking in one of our groups on WhatsApp the other day. If anyone deserves it, if these numbers are true, if anyone deserves it, for staying at that one club and doing what he's done at that one club, Leo Messi deserves it. If he, if there's someone has to get that, it's oh, him. But this score six hundred and fiftieth goal at weekend. Like he's just, he's just done it all. The numbers are crazy. With the, the 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 numbers on social media that he brings them, the 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 viral stuff that goes on. Let alone the trophies that this guy's been a part of at the club. Man, he has brought sustained success to this club, and he's a he's the amazing one. Man, but I don't believe it. I don't believe the hype. I don't believe the media frenzy around it. I don't believe any of it. I, I, heard he, I heard he's uh, suing them, innit? Yeah, yeah, he's suing the newspaper. Them and Barcelona are suing the newspaper. Not necessarily because I think it's wrong. I think they're suing it because it's been leaked, is what they're saying. Hmm. But let me just throw this at you then. Let's pretend you do own a top-flight football club. You owe a billion. You've got a 34-year-old, regardless of what he's done, that's 10 top-draw players' weekly wages. And 200 million is you know, a bit of a transfer kit. Are you giving it messy or are you rebuilding a club, which is what you could do with that sort of cash? Only if I, if it's coming from somewhere else, that money that is underhand or under the table from somewhere that I've got like a, a country giving me the money to do it. That's the only way it's getting done. That's the only way it can get done. Simple as that. Other than that, I'm reinvested in the squad. Yeah. <laughs> That's well mad, 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 mad. He literally could fund his own football team on the back of that. Yeah, he probably will. We go back to Buenos Aires. Mr. Peter Odenwingi, thank you very much for coming on. How can we do a transfer deadline day without speaking to the one and only Mr. Peter Odenwingi? Thank you. Thank you. How you doing? Common sense, that is real. <laughs> How you doing? Listen, I know the guys have got loads of questions, man. I, I'm going to start it off. Listen, we all know what it means uh, to clubs, to fans, um, and as importantly, the players what transfer deadline day is. I was a player, I just sit there and just look at the paper, look online, who's coming, who's not. As a player who actually was transferred on transfer deadline day, what is the pressure like from a player's perspective? Oh, it's huge, it's huge. Um, in my case, I had two deadline day moves and they were both as dramatic as it can get. 
and the second one was in, uh, in front of the TV screens, but it was probably more dramatic than uh, the first one with Queen's Park Rangers. But, you know, for myself, I had six months of, I will say, inactive. I wish to be, I wish to be more active because uh, that year I missed out on the Nigerian squad winning the AFCON, you know, uh, gold medals. And then in a year's time, there was World Cup coming in. So for myself, I, I, I said, you know, you need to get yourself back to playing, playing regularly, playing in a position where you prefer to be played, because there were a lot of changes I went through in the last six months. So that, the, the, that day was uh, very important for myself. It ruined things for me, and I didn't get to back to the national team for another year, I will say, until I got, I got the move to Cardiff first. But then that move wasn't great. I wasn't scoring. I scored one goal in five months. Then when I got to Stoke in January again, uh, it was a swap deal this time between uh, Stoke and Cardiff. Myself, I went one way and Kenwin Jones. We both were looking for, you know, where we could be more effective. Cardiff were looking for a tall striker and uh, Stoke, uh, Mark Hughes was looking for a, a fast, uh, p- pacey player. So it was a good one for me and I bounced back from uh, from that and made, uh, made it to the World Cup. So for me, the transfer deadline day, especially at the end of your career, when you know the ambitions you had uh, have, haven't come to fruition. So I had to do everything I could to make sure that I used my time, you know, the little time that was left, because I came to England at the age of 29, which it happened earlier, but I had to make the best out of my career. So, yeah, of course, when you have a young family as well, you have to consider so many things, changing of schools and all of that. It's not an easy decision. Um Maybe fans sometimes don't know what how much you have to deal with, but it's a, a lot to to decide on. So, do, do you find that really late? And uh, what, did, was things just like, oh, right, I've got to move, pick up stuff like, for instance, the QPR thing seemed like it was a really quick, like impulsive thing. On the day, yes, but for two weeks it was dragging on for a bit, you know, back and forth. Um, and then on the day, it's everything seemed okay. In the morning, you know, we had a training session. I, I, I was okay even to miss the training session because. In the morning, all of a sudden, there was a change in how uh, we we listened to each other. Probably not as much as nothing changed new as in communication, uh, like verbal. But we started listening to each other, and it, we we found an agreement. You know, and it was kind of on their terms more. So I accepted the terms, and yeah, I was surprised uh, I could even miss the train and say to Steve Clark, then who was my manager, and say, Steve, looks like we found an agreement here. Um, everyone happy. And uh, yeah, he said, OK, good luck. And I left. So there were no indications that there would be any problems. The agent who was trying to do, uh, seal the deal even had a meal. Like they took him in the restaurant, they had a peaceful meal. So I went and uh, said goodbyes to the players even uh, in the dressing room. I promised them a, a meal next week when I come back, you know. <laughs> so uh, like the breakdown of it uh, happened because uh, Junior Hoylet was, uh, they said to me like that, that he was supposed to go the other way. But we didn't have those discussions, but they never came out publicly and say we had our discussions going on with Junior Hoyle. They collapsed. And so the deal can't go through. So I was left like how English people say being thrown under the bus. So, mm. yeah, it ruined my reputation a bit. But, you know, sometimes tests and trials are good for us. I bounced back with a smile. So right in front of everyone who criticized me. So, yeah, um, a mm. lot uh, uh, in this story is untold. You know, but um, a lot of fans like, OK, that time QPR is giving out a lot of money. The guy is so desperate for money. But I had even better contract in West Brom at the time. And I was going for less money even in QPR because, you know, I, I come from humble background. You know, I was dreaming to come to Premier League. Mm-hmm. I, I'm from Russia. If I needed money, I'd go back to Motherland and take uh, all the money I needed to. You know, I had offers. Even that day, mm-hmm. I had to consider an offer from Qatar. But uh, that wasn't a wow. question because Brazil World Cup was all in my head. I need to bounce back. I'm missing out on uh, AFCON. I'm not in the national team anymore. So, um, yeah, it uh, gave me a mountain to climb. But at the end of the day, the childhood dream of scoring in the World Cup happened. Um, and as I told you earlier, I remember your positive comment. Uh, after my first World Cup game, when the coach still criticized me, he said I didn't play to instructions. And you said in the studio, that I was a breath of fresh air, did well, and that earned me a starting. Uh, I was in the starting lineup in the next game, and I scored in the next game a winner. <laughs> <laughs> so the power of the pundit is there. It's live it's and there, kicking. It's there. So you can make a move happen. So you, you, 
so you know that, that obviously the embarrassment of of being left at the door at QPR, so to speak. How does how do you recover from that mentally? How do you get past that? Because obviously it's a big thing. You're making a decision based on hopefully going to, to the World Cup with Nigeria, uh, your family, your career. How do you recover? Oh, it's tough. It was tough, you know. I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, by nature, you know, I'm somebody blessed with a merry heart. Like, I am content. Whatever happens, whatever life throws at me, I'm just content. You know, it's just something mm. I've had uh, when I was playing, before I started uh, having a big career in football. Till date, I'm the same, you know. So, but I believe a lot of people would have uh, struggled to come out of this. But as Gianni Gallo says, one who enjoyed the transfer deadline, I think, a year ago, for his childhood dream to come to pass and join your former uh, club, Man United. He says, I'm a small boy with a big God. So it's the same <laughs> way. You know, I have a faith that I rely on always. You know, it's something that doesn't change. The Bible is there. Well, you know, most times we go to it when we're in trouble. But, uh, so you know, sometimes we need to go there when it's not just trouble. So I go there, I read the scripture, it doesn't change. You can bounce back. You can do all things. So I lifted myself up. Of course, the... You know, I was under a lot of uh, pressure, you know, from fans. You know, my, my son turned up to the stadium. First time, he was just born in January. Uh, and uh, I didn't even want them in the stadium. My my wife then brings him to the stadium. He was, at, like, just a few weeks old. I have pictures of that day. And right in front of uh, him and uh, on my wife, then, uh, the whole stadium, like, the whole stand was saying, there's only one greedy bastard they sang yeah and oh i'm like God. i'm like thank goodness my son doesn't uh, doesn't speak yet doesn't understand what they're singing yeah, yeah. time will come i'll explain to him uh, that these are all lies <laughs> so, <laughs> it was a tough day but i went you know held his hands he wasn't far away from where i was warming up so i only got like five minutes against sunderland that day but that day was a test of you know you know i had to go warm up right in front of uh people that yesterday, you know, actually a week before that, I scored it, uh, in front of that stand, I scored the equalizer last minute against Aston Villa and the whole stadium, like, we've gone crazy. Like, that same spot, in a week's time, they were singing another song to me. So, wow. <laughs> football is like that, but, you know, you have to take the good with the bad, you know, because uh, uh, you know yourself how it is. One day you're mm -hmm. a hero, another day, you know, you're the villain. So, tough thing to go through. And this uh, Saido Biraino story, it, uh, it, it's a kind of, uh, well, it can tell you what can happen, you know, if things go wrong or, or, or with transfers, not everybody have a good coping mechanism to bounce back. And Saido, mm. who was uh, linked with Spurs for 20 million transfer, he's now nowhere to be found. Not nowhere, but he's playing in a small team in Belgium. But at uh, that time, he was scoring uh, for West Brom away at Old Trafford, scoring a winner for West Brom. And six months later, he's... Uh, He's in Stoke, you know, not scoring a single goal in one year. You know, mental strength wasn't there because the story of him is he grew up without a father. So a lot of things can go wrong, you know. Um, but the thing is, you know, mm. people like Van Dijk, when they were putting transfer requests forward, they go back to their clubs, they play. But if you go back to your club and you're not playing, then, you know, the problems get worse and worse. And, you know, sometimes, you know, before you know, you're mm. drinking. Yeah, because you're, everybody knows that you wanted to leave. Yeah. Yes. Everybody exactly. knows you wanted to leave exactly. and you have to go back. And then it's very, very hard to, to get the fans back on side. Uh, yeah, that's it. And today we are so exposed uh, to to uh, via social media. It's a different ball game, you know. And if you get involved, like replying fans, you spoil your day. You can be aggressive at home. Things can go wrong suddenly. You know, you can drive too fast somewhere. You can do something silly because it takes one moment of losing control and your life is totally different, you know. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's uh, these things, the clubs need to consider this, you know. I think, uh, you know, the, if I ever visit uh, like um, uh, PFA one day or I'll have anything to do with, with football, I'll have to chip in the fact that now um, uh, the PFA has this line that you can call if you're struggling from depression because few players, you know, to even <clears throat> try to, to commit suicide at some point, not because of transfer failure, but just in general. After life, you know, things change so much. Now they have this uh, there, but I think clubs need to be aware of what players are going through because you are easily, you know, abused in uh, on social media if things don't go wrong. So they have to know what statements they put out. And West Brom really failed with that. When my thing happened, they just put out this uh, a statement that um, uh, we we didn't have a replacement for Peter. Uh, that's why we didn't let the the uh, deal go through. 
but the truth about it is the same people who put that statement out were the same people showing me a mobile phone, like our sport director then in the morning. He said, Peter, I tried to make it happen. He's showing me his log. He said, look at the phone calls from Canada. I was on, on the phone with his father um, trying to sort it out. But I'm like, Dan, if you told me it was about a swap deal, I was never even going to drive to London. It was never the mm -hmm. case, right? So they had nothing to say. And eventually he left the club, you know, because he told me once, he said, I've had enough. But this is things like people don't know on the outside, you know. But so that statement mm -hmm. of his, like how they acted, they, they could ruin a life. But, you know, but, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a blessed man. I'm a strong man. And, uh, yeah. but not everybody can bounce back from what I, I did, you know, especially mm -hmm. being called a legend in the club. So much love for you there. People putting their tattoos on them uh, after my hat trick against Wolves. So there are things clubs need to consider before, you know, they take a stance, like uh, like a, a firm stance that this is how it's going and this not. Of course, we respect that you have to be clever. You know, it's a two-way relationship. I was uh, getting a bit old. I wasn't a side of Berahino's age. I was a bit older. There were a few things happening way before that, that I wanted to, to leave the club uh, six months before that. Anyway, they, I think they mismanaged the situation badly. But um, uh, it's something, of course, I will use in my book when I write my book, you know, I bought your book, Rio. I haven't read it yet. So there are no transfer sagas. Well, mine will be, I will have the photo of my deadline day failure. But, you know, it will be a, a positive book that, you you know, you you don't arrive good. always where you want. It's a matter of time. <laughs> Maybe good, one day good. I'll be a coach of Queen's Park Rangers and they will let me in finally. <laughs> Joe, what you got? Hey, uh, yeah, I've got a question. Um... It's, I find it very interesting how you're talking about, you know, mental strength. You know, you've talked about a lot of things mentally. Um, when you are having these discussions and you know that you might be leaving and you might be moving, are you already playing for that club in your head? So, for example, are you looking at the squad, the team, where you're going to be playing, the style of football? How does it feel? 100%. Because, you know, it was Harry Redknapp was the coach in, uh, in Queen's Park Rangers then. And... People, maybe it's it comes out like a secret. It's not a secret that before a player moves to a club, there have been already some talks, like an idea, an idea roughly what to expect. So the agent, uh, you know, says uh, he knew what I'm looking for. I said ideally before he even went out to search for me. I said I'm looking for a club I could play as a striker. I'm looking for you know more game time. I want to make sure you know it's somebody that admires my game and who will who who will supply the passes as well. Because there was once I was in Lille, I was playing in France, and there were talks with uh, Werder Bremen. That time, uh, Klose was leaving to Bayern Munich, and Diego was a fantastic midfielder. So they, they, the sport director explained, we said, you and Diego pairing will be fantastic. So they have to mm -hmm. convince you as well, like, how will you be effective on the pitch? So Loic Remy signed for Queen's Park Rangers that uh, few weeks before that. They had a positive result against Man City, which was 1-1. And I believe they beat Everton that week 3 Three, uh, they beat Everton. So that's four points out of two difficult games. So the signs were like of recovery were there. So I was like, okay. And then, of course, uh, the, the agent giving me information um, is like, you know, if you play up front, because me and Shane Long, we were doing great things together. So uh, Remy was a top striker from France, good one. So, and I was like, okay, you know, well, that would be a good pair. You know, he can, uh, you know, distract people. It will disturb people like Rio for me, and I'll take video <laughs> on what we used to do before. So, uh, of course, you have a bit of a rough idea if you can be perform there. Because as I said, I'm going, I want to go to the World Cup. If I go to a club where it's just a name and I'm not going to be playing or I will not be playing in my position or being effective, I'm not getting no call up. So, of course, you, you think about that a little bit uh, before you before you take a decision. Cool. Peter, you said that obviously the fans reacted pretty negatively to your attempted move to QPR, but how did the squad react to you when you went back to training? No, squad was cool, you know. One first thing is uh, they know pers your personality. There was, I never had, like, real problems. We had a bit of problems when I, I broke the, the bank of the chairman, who was the tightest man, probably everybody know him <laughs> in the game. <laughs> he, he, it's not a critique, it's just his, his character, you know, even our sport director, Kitman, in the kitchen, everybody will say, like, he's so careful with money. So, 
I, I was the first one to get a bigger contract. And then even my first one, which was a big pay cut I took from coming from Russia, you know, and uh, then after a year, they said, if you do well, you score the goals because I knew I will score goals. I'm confident. I believe, you know, I moved by faith. So I did the job. They gave me a new contract a year after. And that was kind of causing already problems a little bit within the dressing room because we had a successful season, top 10 in the Premier League and everyone else who are, and the club is not used to being, in, you know, big contracts. So then I was kind of the first to open the door and kind of, you know, succeed with that. But it's just, you know, a reward. What we discussed even a year ago, it's not like now I want some privileges more than anyone else. It was an agreement before I even signed my first contract. Otherwise, I wasn't even going to come to West Brom. So, OK, I even took it as a promise, but I knew I would deliver. And we went back to the table and renegotiated and I went on. So there was a bit of uh, uh, those things already. Well, listen, Peter, man, really appreciate your time. And thank you very much for just speaking to us about his, the, the incidents that happened to you on transfer deadline day. Insightful, man. My pleasure, man. I hope you, you guys know a little bit more now. I'm sure. Yeah, I, yeah. See, I think I gave out something that should be in my book only. <laughs> <laughs> no, we appreciate it, man. And I know okay. you're catching up on your sleep after being with the kiddies, so we let you get back to bed now. I did. Thanks. <laughs> Cheers, okay, man. Okay, guys. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Bye bye. So, Joel, how did you celebrate your nil nil victory over United at weekend? <laughs> what are you talking about, bro? Listen, I think you lot forget that we came to you lot's ground, yeah, and we spanked you earlier this year. I didn't get no messages from none of you. I didn't get a message from you. I didn't get a message from you. So let's let's just leave it out. But in regards to you know this, what? I've weekend, seen in some of the I've seen in some of the comments. Yeah, there's a bit yeah. of needle between you two. Yeah. Ten cents in his day to that United Arsenal. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> Joel was not here. It's his problem. I, watch, I, got no I, issue watch, with it. I can't even hear him. I watch half, I watch games sometimes in Manchester with Steve, you know. People don't know. We just go out and we'll watch games together, whatever. But if he jars me, he jars me. We just get on with it. But on the weekend, yeah, we didn't speak, did we? No, I texted you to ask you something Saturday morning. And then I was like, right, fuck off. I'm not talking to you now. And then I said, I thought, sharp, man. You know what I mean? Especially when it was nil-nil, it weren't going on. I thought, look at this guy. Uh, but flipping, yeah, I don't think the game was... I don't think it was very exciting. It's probably... Um, how many games has it been now that Man United haven't beaten a top six side, you know? Uh, didn't beat City. Got thrashed against Spurs. Um, lost against us. Drew against us again. So we've taken four points of you. Um, it's just, yeah, I don't think you, you drew against Chelsea. I don't know, man. That's not championship yeah. winning form. Why are you talking about Arsenal on top sides, though? But we played you, though. We're the original. When you're talking about the original top six, we're in there. No, no, not now, though. We're talking now. We're talking about recent, that like, recent but top six. big things. games, though, bro. How much pro? So if we're nothing, why didn't you, why did you do all that promo in your IG? Like all the all the extra stuff, like because it's a big no, game. No, no, you know what it is? It's because it's because a lot of people that follow me are Arsenal fans, yeah, which I love. It's great for banter, and they've got a great <laughs> following. They're just good people, man. But and I'm a London boy, and people in it. But if you're talking top six, are like Arsenal a top team for real? Is that what you're saying? No, it's a big game. It's the game that gets I the numbers. That, that wasn't the question, no. Joel. The question no. was, do you consider Arsenal a top six team right do you, now? Do you? When you're looking at teams, when the fixture list comes out in the beginning of the season, both of you, Steve, Rio, what top games are you looking at? Liverpool. I was looking, when, Thierry, when Thierry Henry and Patrick Vieira was there, Arsenal was one of the top I was looking for. Right now, if I'm a Man United player now, and I'm looking for the top, top games, That's the who I'm buying up. trophies with. I didn't say Man Arsenal United player. I said there. you. I said you. Oh. Yeah, well, like, Bamiyang's a big draw. Do you know what I mean? I like Mikel Arteta and what he's trying to do there. So, yeah, I like that. But in terms of, like, you, you saw the game the other day. It was a dead game. game. And I think Man United must be kicking themselves now. And I think they were yeah. at the end of the season. So, you know, that was a game that was there for the taking and we didn't have the personality, the character, the, the, like, the, the know-how to go and take that game. We didn't seize the moment. That's the, main, that's, that's the biggest thing that I got in the game. They did not seize the moment. And that was a disappointing thing for me. But let's this, this get it right. Let's not get too carried away with Man United, right? I was looking for progress this year and a, a consolidating top four with a good couple of cup runs was where I was at. I weren't looking at a championship challenging team because we were too far away from the big uh, Liverpool and Man City teams. 
But where we are now, I'll take it. it. But this is what I I expected. Stop it. It's true. Because last week, yeah, you was you came here talking about, oh yeah, we're sitting pretty top of the league. Pretty life comes at you fast, you know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and and you got to enjoy enjoy the good time, but don't get carried away. Stop it, stop it. Joe, yeah, sitting yeah. outside the top two in about nine years. Ah, stop it. Stop always it. I'm not trying to hear it. Nah, I'm not having it. It don't matter if you're Champions League winners, supporting successful teams. I've got to say my bit here, yeah? You guys, obviously, expectations change as the season goes. You guys were just happy to be in the mix. But you must be disappointed with how your week's gone. With Sheffield, Arsenal. You guys have dropped major yeah, points, man. Yeah, you no one's going to be dropping five points. Yeah, no, but it's not just dropping five points. It's what that could potentially mean at the start, uh, at the end of the season. And I told you guys a few weeks ago, City are coming, and they're coming hard, bro. And now Liverpool yeah. found four. I've said all year, City are favourites for this league because that's where I see them. Man United is still second, you know. You're talking like yeah. Man United dropped out of the top six. Yeah, we'll yeah, still. But, you come the end of the but year. You know, it's it's not convincing it's not though. Right. You know, it's not convincing. I agree with you, look- Joe. I I agree, hundred percent. Right. This week, especially, has been a, a week where Man United got himself into Damn position boy. and haven't produced, yeah? Haven't seized the moment. But, like I said, man, it's the way it is. It's just life. Things happen. Like you say, it comes at you fast. You've got to enjoy the good times when they come. The problem is sometimes Arsenal, like you and your team, get too excited and have open bus to- like tours when you win the FA Cup. Like, we weren't that's doing rich, that when the that's, and the that's rich league. coming from the guy. That's rich coming from the guy who posted on social media. Yeah, mate. I'll see you tomorrow night when Man United at the top of the league. That that's rich coming from <laughs> you. Still, that Bro, you, rich. I told you, enjoy it sometimes. That's what I do, man. I enjoy the time. Take the licks Boy. when it comes to you and it's not going well, and enjoy it when it's going well. Joel, Drake overall, same in London at the minute. Uh, you know what. <laughs> Let me be real in it because I know what you guys want. West Ham are the best team in London right be. now. West Ham are the best team in London. Don't come no more. West Ham on form, but with two shell coming in, Chelsea are going to be running things, man. You're fourth at best, aren't you? Two shells going to be running things in general. Do you know what I mean? West Ham so, are the best uh, team in London right now. Is that right or not? West Ham. Listen, I know you got a West Ham fan base that you're trying to keep happy in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you are. Yeah. They've got obviously they're doing decent, but um, yeah, I don't think he's gonna survive, man. I mean, don't get me wrong, Moyes is doing a really good job and it's proper proper underrated because when he went back, I thought this guy, man, why did he go back? They treated him like rubbish the first time, but I've got to say he's got them boys playing well, man. Well mm. done. Right, that's it from us this week. Cheers for all the suggestions for our name. I guess we've gone with vibes with five. Vibe with vibes five. Two like it, I guess. Vibe with five. <laughs> you know what I mean? These two like it, so. Majority wins, I guess, in this case. Uh, but cheers for tuning in. Um, cheers to Peter Adam Winger for joining us. Um, and cheers for you guys for tuning in and watching. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, let us know who else you want to see on the channel uh, because we mm. can get some uh, pretty tasty guests on here, I reckon. So let us know in the comments who you'd like to see us get on from me, from Joel, from Rio. We'll see you in the next one. Later. See you guys. <laughs>